here from the EQ Bills, the water quality coordinator for the, the region here. And we've been working with Bill for quite some time on this plan. And it's part of the Clean, the Federal Clean Water Act, and this is something that we are required to do. Um, is when we submit this plan, it requires that, um, that the county commits to it and summon an authority a signing document. This typically means either the board or the board directing Dan. And so that's the reason that we're here, is this is something that uh, the county is committing to to have your involvement in it, authorizing it or in signing the submittal. So what we'd like to do is I've asked Bill to spend just a couple of minutes talking about what a team deal is, why we do them, and what the expectations are, and then Kelly and I will walk through um, just basically what it is exactly. And, and just one second for you. So we already do have a plan. Yeah. The board approved our plan about five years ago, so I don't think any of you are last year. The proposed plan that came from the EQ isn't anywhere near what our approved plan ended up being. We essentially, I think, Kelly was here. I think we no, were not here. So yeah. A lot of the other cities just signed on to the plan the way that it was proposed. We didn't want to do that. There were a lot of things in there that would have cost the county money, which we essentially looked at as an unfunded mandate. Um, and essentially, DEQ worked with us to modify the plan to where we had agreements that we, we could receive credit for things like mitigations we did on projects that we were already doing, like uh, old ray dam removal when we um, replanted the riparian uh, area, but we could get credit against that for cleaning the water and filtering uh, discharge into the river, items like that, where we're already doing them, but we can get credit, not where we actually would proactively go out and spend county general fund dollars on doing something. So um, this, when it gets explained to you, is much of the same process. It's been a negotiation to get to where we are. My opinion of this is actually that it's less stringent <coughs> than the last plan that we entered into. Um, and I'm not saying that it was a comfortable negotiation that um, both sides are completely satisfied with it. That's usually how it happens when we negotiate. Um, and I'll let John and Kelly talk about the points where we think it's less restrictive than the last plan that we had, and we thought that we did fairly well, and that the EQ worked with us well in the last plan and this plan as well. So with that, so. Okay, good morning. Um, so I am Bill Myers. I'm with the Department of Environmental Quality, um, and I'm located here in the Medford office. Um, I'd also like to introduce my coworker. Um, this is Priscilla Wolverton. So my focus is, the, is on the road basin, water quality specific. Priscilla assists out of the Eugene office, and then her area is Western Region. So that was good for Priscilla to kind of have eyeballs on the meeting today. Um, in terms of background, um, Danny is correct that this is the second iteration of the county's TMDL implementation plan. TMDL stands for Total Maximum Daily Load, and what that is is the implementation of the Federal Clean Water Act through the state of Oregon. Within Jackson County, within the Rogue Basin, in Josephine County, Curry County, there are waterways that do not meet water quality standards during all times of the year. So for those waterways that do not meet water quality standards, it's required that DEQ goes through an exercise to develop a TMDL. And what that TMDL looks like, here's, here's the document for the Rogue Basin. Um, it's pretty hefty. What that is, is that's an analysis of all the waterways to the best of our knowledge um, and a determination of um, how much pollution or what the impairments are for these waterways. The county and as well as other entities within uh, the Rope Basin is required to develop an implementation plan. And that's what we're talking about today. The implementation plan covers a period of five years and it identifies what the county is doing. So you want to take credit for the actions that the county is doing um, and for current actions and what the county would like to do in the future to protect water quality. So this is the county's role in protecting water quality within, within county jurisdiction. It only applies to those activities that are within the jurisdiction of the county. 
the other activities that are um, that are overseen by agriculture or by forestry, private forestry, federal forestry, the cities they're in, irrigation districts, DEQ is working directly with them. So these other entities have analogous plans to the one that we're discussing today. Can I have you, you have yes. ask you to go into a little more detail into the activities within the jurisdiction of the some brief description of what those might be yes. and what, yes. what perceived ones might be that really are. Do you want, to, uh, are you asking to go over kind of our plan? We're, we're going to do that. Because we're going to do that. Okay. He's just, and we've just asked him to come and give the background and some information on teeing up the TMDL. For I just want to make sure that those activities are discussed. Are discussed. We'll, we'll discuss we're going to okay. okay. Great. Okay. Um, with that, I, I think I'll end there unless there's a specific question. And then as, as we have a discussion, and field questions. So do you guys have any questions about basically what a team deal is, why we do it, and it's got all of those things that we are asked to do it, we're expected to do it, and we're required to do it. But we have to build a come because a lot of times, Ken and I get questions on this and say, why are you doing that? And what's going on? Because so let, let, me, let, me, let, me, <laughs> let, let me give you some perspective. Last time we met, Ashland was having problems with discharge pollution in the Bear Creek at the, at the time, although this is for the Bear Basin. Um, and Ashland wasn't meeting the requirement. It was a, a heat issue and also bacteria pollution, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so we asked, our board and myself asked, what are you doing about that? So they're not meeting it, what happened? So, Maybe you could talk about some of the enforcement pieces about things that happen when you're not meeting it. Um, and, you know, in, in Ashton's case, I'm using it as an example, so the okay. purpose and reference. They received a letter with direction that they need to improve this, and as long as they were working towards a plan, DEQ wasn't being heavy-handed with them, they were trying to work with them to bring them along. You can jump in if I'm missing anything important. Okay, yeah. But, so, uh, to, to talk about what happens if you don't do this? I mean, I don't think there's a good example anywhere in our state or with any of the local jurisdictions where all of a sudden we're being fined a he heavily amount of, of dollars, although that is one of the tools that you have. That is a tool that's available. But they haven't been, in my, in my, in my experience, haven't been strong in using that. They've you know, tried to work cooperatively, and I know people don't like that word sometimes, but work together with agencies. Uh, Gold Hill, I think, is probably another example, um, and, and maybe you guys have some more, but those are questions you may want to ask about. So what happens if we don't do what we're told we're supposed to do in the Clean Water Act? What are all the things that can happen to the county? Maybe so so I, can, I can fill you in. So as per our Division 12, those are our enforcement rules through DEQ, failure to develop an implementation plan is a class two violation and failure to implement a plan. So develop or implement either one of those is a violation. They are class two violations which allow us to issue a warning letter and then come up with a schedule for implementation. Were they class one violations, we would immediately have to refer those to enforcement. So they are class two violations, there is the, the warning letter, there's discussions of what is it going to take to get back on track. We have not exercised um, full enforcement of these rules to date. We have issued warning letters um, within the county uh, as well as across the state. Warning letters have been issued and then the management agencies, we have discussions and there is compliance. So what would be an example of a class one violation? Um, pollution to waters of the state. So um, dumping or placing wastes in a position where they are likely to or they are in waters of the state. And that is an immediate, that's a violation that is immediately referred for enforcement. So if, a, if an entity doesn't follow through after the warning letter and tell the plan, what's the, what's the further sanctions or further you know, I think we would have a discussion like this, you know, it, it, this type of discussion to determine the reason why the plan is not being developed. Is it staffing resource? Is it um, a technical 
lack of technical expertise or information, um, or is it that the, the jurisdiction is not going to comply, that this is a test case, the decision's been made, and then that would influence our decision. Um, in, in this process, we work with the counties. We're also working with small cities. Um, I'm working with Butte Falls. You know, the small cities, we acknowledge that resources are very, very limited. Um, however, everyone has a role to play. You know, uh, in a large jurisdiction, we would expect a more detailed plan. For a small jurisdiction, where there is small input, we'd expect them to look at what their potential inputs are and report on that. Any else on that? Uh, so when you refer to enforcement, is that, who is that? Uh, that is our legal staff. So those are our environmental law specialists. So I'm, I'm technical staff, and then it gets into the legal realm. Of the DEQ. Of the DEQ. Um, in which case, there's consultation with the uh, state's attorney general. You know, th there's that kind of conversation from the legal perspective. So there's the state level <coughs> enforcement, and there's federal level enforcement. And correct me if I'm wrong, but right now Oregon is under review for whether or not we're actually in compliance with our T TMBLs for compliance with the Clean Water Act. Is that correct? Um, it's, it, we're being reviewed by EPA for implementation of the Coastal Zone Reauthorization Act. Which affects? And there are elements, there are elements not necessarily of our TMDL program, but the on-site program is one, and then forestry is another one. Um, and the forestry component is the one that EPA did not approve this last go-around. So the state is feeling. So what I'm saying is there's a, the a state-level enforcement where this is delivered at the state level look to the local governments and private property owners and timber and all that and then there's the federal branch that oversees this and it is essentially all completed through administrative process correct 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 and there is also as you mentioned as the private landowners is that third party perspective from the perspective of DEQ and EPA the development of the implementation plan is compliance with the Clean Water Act. Is if the plan is being has been developed and it's being implemented, that is viewed as compliance. So, from a third party perspective, you know the county is doing something, but they're following their plan. We have approved it. We, being DEQ, have approved the plan that that it meets the Clean Water Act. So, um, in in terms of <coughs> Um, the potential third-party lawsuits, this is compliance with the Clean Water Act. One more question. Um, it, it, trying to find an example. Was there an example with the city of Medford with TMDL in uh, a temperature issue and a pretty heavy fine? I'm just I've heard bits and pieces. Or um, is that class one, class two? Um, in terms of a TMDL violation, I'm not aware of a penalty with the city of Medford. Um, there was a riparian removal, uh, what would it be, it was a creek cleaning project and the contractor removed the vegetation, all of the trees along the creek, it's on Swanson Creek. What that resulted in was a letter from, from, from DEQ acknowledging that that was questionable as per the plan. The city responded by planting, by replanting that area and having discussions with the contractor. Um, penalties, yeah, so there, I, I know of other penalties with the city, but they were not connected to TMDL implementation. So, while, while we spent some time talking about potential enforcement, and it's, and it's a real topic because we don't comply with this. Sanction doesn't exist, but the bottom line is we're not there. We're we're complying with the TMDL requirements that we've been asked to do. We had a plan that went from 2010 to 2015, and that's ending. And now we're asking for your approval and support for 2015 to 2020. Um, when we developed the 2010-2015 plan, one of the challenges we had is there's really no department that does this in the county. And so essentially, what we did is we carved out pieces of development services and roads and parks 
and we were able to focus on things that we largely did already. I mean, for example, one of the things that the team did all can address is reporting uh, acceptance issues. Well, we have a code enforcement division. They, that's something they can do. Okay, so we can call the EQ and some call less and see what's on the specific tank. We can report that in the EQ and we can document and track that that we're, that we're doing that. Um, we do things on, as Danny noted, um, for road construction and maintenance, where we're putting in check dams to, to capture sediment before it goes in the stream. We do that already. Okay, let's document it and take credit for it in the plan. So we were able to carve out some pieces of each department and identify those things that we were already doing and put those in a plan. Some of the harder ones were things like illicit discharges, where we have a program where we go out to the county and we look at, <coughs> say, farmers' fields and who's, who has runoff from the field going into the county ditch that's going into the creek. And then go talk to that farmer. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that. No, I was going to say that's a tougher one. And we don't do that. Um, but, uh, so those were the things that were a little more difficult for us to, to deal with, and we haven't been doing them. So Kelly's going to kind of walk us through those things that Doug, you asked us, what are we doing exactly, and what's in the plan that we are committing to? You mentioned septic tanks, failing septic tanks. That's a program in inspection with offered permits and stuff like that with septic tanks. Something that we left that the view we didn't do. That is correct. Why would we be monitoring failing septic tanks if that's a state issue? So let me, I think the, the word monitoring is probably. So what we do is if we, if a neighbor reports um, a septic violation, that there's raw sewage running onto their property or running into the creek and they notice that, they know that, then it's likely that they're going to call us instead of calling the EQ, because most people don't think about that. They think about the EQ as being the agency that would enforce. And what we would do then is just communicate with the EQ, that we receive this information and we pass it on. Working with our partners, we do it all the time with things like we work with ODF, Oregon Fish, Department of Fish and Wildlife, the same way. So we're not monitoring septic tanks. We're just passing along information that we get related to code enforcement if there's a failing septic somewhere. And it's being noticed by someone. <coughs> and I'm sure you'll get to it in, 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 in as we go through the plan. But is our plan, do we identify those septic systems, or are we going to be paying for those septic systems or anything like that? No. No, all we're doing is, and, and I'll, I'll kind of go through that too, in terms of what exactly we'll do with those. Can I just ask what the context when you go through the plan? This has been, this has been developed and reviewed by the EQ for compliance with clean water. Okay, so this Correct. Is, and this is in, I guess, in your opinion, less restrictive than the previous plan. Is. I I would say it's there. It's um, it's less ambitious, and I think it is what we can do. I think the other plan, like Danny and John have said, and even I think Bill would acknowledge this. The plan that we had from 2010 to 2015 was new. We had a lot of things in it. There were uh, like 13 programs that we, 13 kind of categories that we had. We've you know, that there were more than that when I was first. <laughs> there were probably more than 20. So, um, so we negotiated that in 2010, and we negotiated this in 2015. And I think this plan that you see before you, um, while DEQ may want us to do more, and we may, from a funding standpoint, want to look at this and say we would like to even do less. I think this we've negotiated this. And this is a good place for the county to be in terms of what we what we really can do. Um, Which is a lot based on what we're already doing. Right. So what we're trying right. To and it's based it's a on matter of collecting and reporting to show that you know you can be doing all of these things, but if you can't document it and show compliance with the Clean <coughs> Water Act, mm -hmm. then you can't prove you're complying with it. So that's essentially what we do. And again, like John said, and Danny has said. Um, there is not any direct funding to Jackson County for these activities. Um, and so it, this plan didn't come with sort of a checkbook from someone else to say, this is how you're going to fund all these things. Um, so we're funding it to the best of our ability. And, and then for uh, one, one thing to add on your plan, well, those on the bottom is a list of partners. Mm -hmm. And then on the right hand side, it says staffing. One of the things that we realized is staff built this plan was, this is the county's plan. There's a lot of people in the county doing things already, and we weren't taking credit for them. And so this, this plan tries to capture those things as well. You know, for example, the Council of Governments has a program to do some of these things. 
well, we know what they're doing on our plan, we get credit for that. And so a lot of what's getting done is actually getting done through our partners. And, and also another one is our, uh, our watershed councils. So let me just kind of, I'm going to briefly kind of go through and hit the highlights of this um, plan. Um, the first is, the first one, solar radiation. This is really, and the strategy is to look at restoring, protect, planting, and removing invasives along creeks. Um, you can see that what we're looking for or specific actions might be to seek opportunities where native plants and trees can be um, planted or removing invasives in public areas along streams and rivers. You'll notice that that says along in public areas. This isn't us going along, uh, going to private property and doing things on private property. Although the county has been involved in um, helping via the land use process, facilitating things like the removal of some invasives on private property that um, Watershed Council has gotten grants for. Um, and you'll see that in terms of these things, looking at um, the measure, for example, the seeking op so here we are in number one, one, and we're looking at seeking opportunities for those planting native plants or removing invasives. Um, you'll see that the staffing is key. That is our rogue TMDL partners. So it's not just us doing all that work or picking, but it's us getting credit for work that is being done. So for example, if um, a watershed council receives a grant to do some planting or remove invasives like um, they had a program um, where they were trying to remove a specific invasive species along this stretch of the Rogue River. We would be able to get credit for that. And so that's, so that's this strategy. Um, and that, this strategy is designed to try to um, have invasive removed or more plants planted along creeks to, to reduce temperature, primarily. Are there any questions on that strategy? This, most of this you'll see, most of the strategy is really going to be carried out by us and our partners. And like I said, those are things that we will do, that we will participate in and get credit for, what other people do as well. Because there's lots of work happening in the unincorporated areas of Jackson County along various creeks that we can get credit for. Do we get any credit for um, the amount of water that's released by the Army Engineers into the river that really affects temperature significantly one way or the other? Is that at all considered in the mix? Um, that is credit for the Army Corps of Engineers. That's part of their management plan. So that's their role to play. And talk, on the county Talk about role, how you measure our contribution to that versus what other people upstream or it's, downstream. It's all about contribute. the county's contribution and, and what is under your jurisdiction. So that temperature is on the road. We're, we're, we're throwing into calculations. However, the county's role to play is under is those things under the county's jurisdiction. So that dam is not under our jurisdiction. Correct. There are certain portions of waterways that are not within our jurisdiction. They fall within the city of Medford or certain rural cities or communities that fall within their jurisdiction. It's not, it, it's our individual contribution to that, not our individual contribution on top of the cumulative contributions of all of those things before or after us. So we're each viewed essentially individually, correct me if I'm wrong, but right. we're each viewed essentially individually with our individual contributions. It's not, if someone else heats the water to, I don't know what a bad temperature is, but let's say 70 degrees, uh, and we add two degrees, we didn't heat it to 72 degrees, we contributed two degrees of temperature to it, or two degrees of temperature reduction from planting it. So that's how it's viewed for with so there's a lot of management by what everyone's contribution is under the Clean Water Act. There's anything you want to add to that? And that was well spoken of. That's exactly right. And, and what I say is, you know, if, if clean water comes into your city or county, <coughs> clean water exits. If dirty water comes in, you can't make it worse. But the fact that it's dirty coming in and dirty going out, that's not your jurisdiction. You just you can't add to it. Okay, so let me go through just a few more. 
You'll notice on number 1B, applying and enforcing our riparian ordinance. As you know, the county has a riparian ordinance and a land development ordinance. Um, it's looking at protecting uh, on most streams, it's 50 feet from top of bank. On the road river, it's 75 feet from the top of bank. And if we have enforcement actions that take place, which we do, people violate our riparian ordinance, um, then we can document those number of violations and communicate on what we did to contribute to um, the remedy to those situations. And just so that you understand, the, the, the setbacks for those ordinances are based on the safe harbor provision within, within state law. Within so it's state laws. Right. So we're the, that those safe harbors are really the minimum that the state would expect and allow us to have. Um, let's skip down to number three: fecal sources, animal waste management. You know, along um, <coughs> the Greenway and in various other places, um, we provide bags for fecal matter for animals. Um, and we document the how many bags we provide, how many bags are used, those kinds of things, because fecal matter along creeks is um, something that contributes to pollution. And so to um, entice people to pick up after their dogs, um, we provide those bags. Primarily the parks, maybe mm -hmm. that's where we do that. So it's in the, the, our public areas. If we could just get humans camping along there for the <laughs> same thing, that would probably be great. Um, th there is, um, a, that, yeah, I don't know where to go from that. There, there. That, 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 that just kind of take, took me off my um, We have dealing with urban and rural runoff. Um, we do this with, and this is mainly with our roads division. Um, so it is something that we do from a staffing perspective with roads. So we're looking to um, establish or refine our illegal dumping or illicit discharge detection program in our phase two area as needed. The phase two area is basically the urban area. So basically think of the places that have curb cut on sidewalk. Typically mm -hmm. is, you know, quite city, perfect example. Mm -hmm. Then we have failing septics, and I think I've spoken to that um, in terms of um, us just doing reporting or passing along information that we get from our citizens regarding um, failing septic systems. And then you'll see we have a large education and outreach component. And I think what we realize is we can't, our eyes can't be everywhere, we can't see everything. But what we can do is provide educational information to our citizens so that I think most people don't purposefully violate the law um, and they're often just, they often just don't know. So um, we have programs to work with um, our partners in um, providing educational material for water quality, um, information for um, the riparian area, what you can and can't do, um, and who you should talk to if you want to do some things. Like if you if you do want to remove some vegetation along the creek, who would you talk to? Well, you know we would refer people usually to the Oregon um, Fish and Wildlife Division to talk th because they deal with um, fish, and so we often they have some help with developing some riparian planting plans. Um, or the Oregon Department of Forestry. So this is just an effort. You can see there's some staffing that we have associated with some of these um, activities, but a lot of them are working with our partners or working with Rogue Valley Sewer Service in, because they provide education as well. Maybe it's my ignorance. I see bacteria and I see temperature and outreach and education. I think it will give you credit. Those two yes, when we do that, we get credit. So if um, if a if our partners and our partners are you know the cities as well, if there's some sort of like at the at the expo, some event takes place, and we provide some handouts on the riparian ordinance or something like that, then we get credit for that. And I think also. In this, it's not just educating 
the public, but it's also providing education and training for our staff. For example, if um, there is a code, a code enforcement, um, they, have an, I mean, they have a group that meets every year. And if they go to something, we want to send someone to something to, to um, where there might be a trainer on identifying um, plants that are invasive or something like that. So our code enforcement officers are out there too. And somewhat they may get a complaint. Someone has removed these in, someone has removed these species along the creek. Well, were they invasive, were they not? They may have a little bit of more education, not to say that they're experts or cultural experts by any means, but providing them education is a good thing as well. And then let's let's skip down to funding. You know, we're always looking for and evaluating, we're always looking for to, to um, provide support to our partners um, in attracting funding for some of these projects because as you know, we don't get any direct money um, for these projects. Um, and then looking at documenting our in-kind support. So Craig and Mike, participate in um, monitoring and collecting information and doing those things and we can get credit for that for that that in-kind activity that they that they provide another example if you did this last year as part of the previous plan we built a whole bunch of check dams and so you have ditches that have a real steep drop and they, and they fall right into a creek uh, or a, a water body of some kind so you might have noticed in several places we go out and, and put some rock in there and do a little check dam. So as that water comes down that hillside, it slows down, the sediment drops out, it spills over, it goes in the next check dam, the sediment drops out, and so what's being discharged into the stream is much cleaner water. Well, we track those and we report those and we get credit for that. But that's work that we did to help clean the water up and make sure that we are in compliance with the clean water up. And it's work and also it's good for our ditches and, and, and everybody wins that we get credit for. And there's money associated with that, so we get credit for spending those kind of resources doing those kinds of activities. Um, and then it's and then tracking and monitoring. So we are required to track and monitor um, and provide information back to the EQ on how we did with our um, activities, what activities we um, we provided what things we did, and we report on that um, on September 30th of each year. So, so I think in a nutshell, we've had five years of experience with a you know a rather um, this the plan that we had, and like Danny said, was even less than what we originally came to the board with. Um, it, this was a plan that was an experiment to see. These are all the, this vast list of things. What is, what are those things that are sort of in our wheelhouse? What are those things that we can actually accomplish with the funding and resources that we have? And I think, and then negotiating with DEQ, I think this is a plan that is more closely aligned with the reality, with the reality of what we can do. Yeah, I guess I just add, uh, you know, any time a regulatory agency is making you do something, it always is our natural tendency to kind of say, it's like a has been good to work with on this. Mike and Craig have uh, spent a lot of time with Bill working through these items. I think Bill's satisfied with our plan and feels like we're on the right track. And, and if you I feel like this is something we can do. We can do this. And it's not, uh, it's not something that's uh, creating problems for our departments in delivering this work. So with that, um, if you have questions, um, you take those. Otherwise, we have to, to, to support um, this, this implementation of the plan. And, uh, and forward. I will say what it has amazed me about the last process, and even this process, is DEQ had a template for the plan the first time. Uh, and a lot of the cities just signed up with what they were providing. And there's no way that any of those cities complied with the plans, and they made a part of the they didn't. And so really, with the county, I pushed 
to say this is not realistic for us, and it wasn't realistic for us. And when I said it was less restrictive, I should have probably said it's more realistic. But you know, to me, it's the same thing. There's less. There's the probably this the equivalent amount of work done is what we were doing because all of the things in here are things we do or our partners do already as a matter of course. They're going to do them. They're just reporting on those things to get credit. There were some things in there that we would have liked, and I know we had conditions on if we can, if we're able to secure funding mm -hmm. for our planning you know, for repairing areas, we would do that. And so I don't think there was a lot of the county doing that. However, watershed councils did a lot of those, that, those kinds of activities. And so, um, yeah, I, I think this, in order for us to comply with the Clean Water Act, I mean, we do have an obligation under the law, federal and state, uh, to do so. I think that this plan puts us where we need to be and it's achievable. And you know, I, I, I would recommend you support that. Questions? I certainly don't see anything unreasonable or really restrictive. And um, as long as we're on top of not spending large amounts of general fund dollars on a funded mandate, I think we want to be involved in a, in a good, efficient, effective clean water policy. So. Well, my thoughts, <clears throat> I appreciate you guys making it realistic. Um, it is, it's interesting how we enforce the Clean Water Act and the non Act, you know? That's the law and the EPA regulation coming down us. I, I detest regulation on it, and it may be doable this year, and obviously we are obligated to comply to protect the citizens of Jackson County. But I see it growing, and, and that is sad. I see it's um, something, uh, a regulatory arm. I get, I get confused say we get credit for doing it. Do they keep a report card? Do we get, what, what does credit mean? We, you know, we get to document. So we have a plan that sets out a variety of activities. And so we monitor those activities and we document when we are con contributing to the success of these activities. And like I said, we put together a, um, a report at the end of the year showing these are the things we did and we got credit. We accomplished these things. And some of the things we accomplished, we took off the list. That was why that they didn't fall off this list. Um, these are more, I, I think, ongoing activities, um, and we monitor and report, and so, and that's, and then we report that to DEQ to ensure that <coughs> they can look at it and see that we're meeting our goals. So let, let, let me add just a little more simplification. To this. The Clean Water Act is very broad. There are all sorts of things that could be could be required in order for us to be considered in compliance. A lot of those things DEQ proposed in the original template that they provided us five years ago, and we said, okay, so we're not going to do these things. We can't do these things. What is, was explained to you by Bill is if we negotiate what we can do and both sides agree, then we're in, and we do them, so getting credit means we do them, <coughs> then we're in compliance with what the state requires to do. So that's what credit means. We've negotiated within this broad scope of things that require, are required within compliance, the things that we think we can do, the things that DEQ agree meet compliance. So they're agreeing that by doing these things, we're being compliant. And then getting credit means we've done them, we've documented and told them that we've done them, shown them we've done them, and that's getting credit, meaning we're compliant. Reporting is a big part of this yeah. Documenting and reporting is, is an important element of this. <coughs> and so reporting is done at what level in our county? Is it Mike and Abel report? Yep. And, yes. yeah, and Craig? What department? I mean, it's, it's just everybody. Here. No, it's a joint effort Rose. between development services. Road to mm -hmm. In our office.
I don't see the partners in there. Is that because it's a separate concept? Or is that something that those can be used in the uh, TMDL activities? And that, in that line item, we could list the partners in there also. I could break you guys. Well, I've looked at Bill a little bit, but my understanding on the interpretation of that is the financial commitment of the agency as opposed to what comes in from all the departments. I, I guess the question I, I hear from the commissioner is, can, can that be a, can, do we have a partner if the deposit is right, and that's part of the funding? Is that, is that something we can Sure, do? yes. Okay. Yes. So we could, so we could add a P to the funding. As we look at yeah, that's line item nine yeah. for the staffing mm -hmm. and the funding stuff, because anytime we get credits for that type of thing, what are doing? Because they do a majority of the grants in the watersheds mm -hmm. for the riparian mm -hmm. and everything like that, the water quality is the most the other. Let me say this. I say this every year when I talk about a budget. A budget is a plan. You're not bound to a budget. It's a plan for how you're going to spend your money. By the end of the year, we don't ever spend it like we originally planned. This is a plan. There are things we're going to do that we may not have written in the plan that we're going to get credit for, whether we wrote it in the plan or not, when we report it. And there are things in the plan that we're going to say we're going to try to do that we're not going to do. Our partners aren't going to do. And, and so it's, it, it, it is a plan. It's not, it doesn't mean that we're bound to everything in here. And it doesn't mean that we're limited by everything that we put in here. So um, I think, you know, we could probably pick apart a lot of the things that we said we're going to do where we could add and take away. Um, and really, like, with a budget, it comes down to the accounting of that budget. So our comprehensive annual financial report, this comes down to the reporting of the plan. So that, that's really where we'll catch all of the things that we may not have put in the plan that may happen, or not do some things that we we'll put in the plan that we would have liked to have done and told that we didn't do. One more question for our county. In the event of something that happened at the Clean Water Act, what is our responsibility to come in there when it's kind of beyond? So what are you talking about? I don't know. Yeah, so it was, uh, I'm sure under the Federal Clean Water Act, and it's totally confusing. So when it's a situation beyond what a planning vegetation of the creek and the things we're, we're trying to do. Yeah, we, we don't have culpability or liability for something in Colorado's case, DEQ, EPA, I'm sorry, contributed to that. That's their contribution. Just like they may clean it up, and that's their contribution. We're only responsible for what we contribute. If we have something catastrophic that the county causes that provides discharge, something with a huge diesel truck that John's working by the side of the Rogue River and they don't, you know, that's, that is our responsibility. That is the kind of responsibility. We're insured for those things. We're self-insured for those things. Um, and the road fund pays into self-insurance for that kind of, for any kind of issue, but that issue would be included. So it's not, it's for things that we either, that are affected by us, both, both in terms of contributing to pollution and taking away from pollution. In this most recent example, one that we deal with a lot, so if we have a stream, one of our dump trucks has a crash and was in the stream, as Danny noted, that's our responsibility. We don't deal with that a lot, though. No, okay. <laughs> 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 I don't I don't even even like <laughs> but, well, the next part, we do deal with that uh, part, John. If a private company's truck crashes in that creek, even though they left our road, it's their responsibility to clean that up. Now, because it's our road, we get involved, but we don't have responsibility for the cleanup. We, make notifications, we do that kind of stuff, but it's the private company's responsibility to clean that up. It's our truck, it's us. It's theirs, it's theirs. Okay. I have one, it's just sort of a general broad question. And we talked about activities within the jurisdiction of the county, so I'm trying to keep it within that section. But let's just say, let's use Barry Green. That's one everybody recognizes. It's a big impact to Jackson County. It's all in the greenway. Everybody knows it has issues. And everybody has talks about wanting to get it cleaned up. And they've been talking about it for years. 
as it enters into our jurisdictional area, let's just say TMDL is, <coughs> let's just say the threshold of what is considered where we can have it is 100 just for the sake of conversation. And it enters into our jurisdiction at 110 above what that would be. And we do everything we can and it comes out of our jurisdiction still in 110. So we're not contributing to anything to that. Mm -hmm. However, what would be the impact to the citizens, the businesses, everything else within our jurisdiction? Would they just be shut down? How does that work under, these, under this plan? How, how, what's the true impact to the community of those people within that live in that area when that, when that, when that scenario happens? Um, I'm a little confused in, in terms of... So let me, let me help it, answer okay. first. Doug, I, I, I'll simplify this again. If it comes into our jurisdiction from Medford and, they're at, and they, if they introduce it at 110, the EQ is working with them on their plan to get them down to 100. If they're not working with us, we don't have the responsibility that local government that introduced it at the point where our jurisdiction takes over has responsibility for reducing, to comply with the requirements of TMDL. TMDL. Uh, and so, once again, it only measures our impact. If our impact increases it, then yes, they're going to be talking to us about our plan, what are we doing to remedy that, and what have we done versus not done, and why haven't we done it, why is it a resource or a technical issue, as I said earlier. So, you know, it goes by, by each individual's, you know, that has jurisdiction of contribution over that point, where, where it enters our, and leaves our place. You know, if we if it enters at 110 and it leaves us at 108 for purposes of your argument, we're we're able to document that we did things within that jurisdiction to reduce that number, and and that complies with our plan. That gives us credit for compliance with the Clean Water Act, and it's a positive you know it's a positive outcome. Um, the the biggest one that you know I think that we dealt with was the Ashland water treatment plant where it was, you know, being discharged, I think, with, uh, was it a sulfur issue? Yeah, phosphorus. Phosphorus yeah, issue. Nutrients. Know, it's been a while. It, nutrients, which were, you know, feeding growth and, and heat and all of those kinds of things. But we weren't responsible for it. And when it, when it entered, when it did enter the county jurisdiction, it was coming to us not in good shape because of that's what happened. All we were responsible for what we did with it from that point on. And that's how every community is. So I, I think that answers your question. Your question is a little convoluted, but I think that's what you're trying okay, to Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're not having to shut stuff down in our jurisdiction or have an impact to our residents based on somebody else. We wouldn't shut no, down. No, no, not based on somebody else. It, and it's really, yeah. And I, I mean, it's just for public, you know, I just want to get it out there and say, hey, right. we're not going to impact our residents if something like that happens. Right. It, it's really looking at where, where the source of the, po the pollution is and, and addressing the source of the pollution as opposed to a community. Right, and and conversely to what, what Danny had mentioned where you know, it comes in at 110 and it leaves at 108, if it comes in at 110 and it leaves at 115, let's say in this unit list factor we've come up with, the, the first thing to look at is, is the plan being implemented as intended and then if it is, then when we look at the plan, we look at adaptive management. Is there more that can be done? Right now, we're assuming that this work right here for, for now, for the next five years, will be sufficient. If in the future it's determined that it's not, we continue to have these conversations. Can you, can you explain the difference with the time to be able between point source and non-point source? Because that was something you didn't talk about. Right? Okay, so point sources are uh, regulated at the end of a pipe. That is the Ashland Wastewater Treatment Plant. It has a permit, a written permit. Stormwater in certain areas, highly uh, population dense areas, are also regulated at the end of the pipe. What this plan addresses is non-point source, and that is pollution that's coming off the landscape. Uh, it's not regulated in the traditional sense in terms of a pipe and a permit. So that's why I asked them to do that, because when you ask would we shut something down, Right. There's a big difference. And typically, when it's regulated by permit, if there's going to be a shutting down, it's it's going to be a legal process within the DEQ. The county's not going to be in 
involved in that. Now, it doesn't mean that we may not be involved in the code violation issue that's contributing to not open source, but we would do that whether it was contributing to our MDL <coughs> or not, because our ordinances require us to do that regardless. We're just going to get credit for doing it on top of the fact that our ordinances require it. So we do need some direction from you about. Further questions? Comments, concerns? No? I, I say I appreciate the staff making it realistic. <clears throat> I detest regulation. But I don't think we have a choice. I think it's a reasonable, like I say, a reasonable plan as far as you know, what we're obligated to do. I think it's, you know, as non-restrictive as, as I think it possibly could be, and I think that it would be probably a good policy to, to uh, participate in the clean water plan. So I, I think it's a, like I say, in my opinion, a very reasonable plan to achieve that. Yeah, the clean water in our area is very important to everybody. And I think that's something that we should be doing our part to make sure we have clean water. And I do agree with your comments on being restrictive and the regulation sometimes there are those who sort of are bad neighbors and sort of help us out to put stuff like this in place to ensure that we don't get more. I want to be preparing over it. Okay, we're going to, we'll bring you an order for approval of uh, the plan. The reason why, uh, rather than authorizing me to sign is because the plan is five years and typically yeah. within our LCRBs, if it ex exceeds a year, even though there isn't a direct cash contribution, because there are county resources going toward it. So. Yeah, we'll bring it to order for adoption of the Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your comments. Appreciate the education. Thank you. Thank you. So this time we'll go ahead and adjourn the regular session and move into executive session.